wow, I really am on vacation. <laughs> they don't really care about you. They care about that 20% that buys 80% of the alcohol. This is a guy that buys a bottle every day if they can, or every week. But if you guys buy a fifth of whiskey, it probably lasts you forever. Like forever. <clears throat> my dad uh, used to... Uh, <laughs> my dad was in the Army Reserve. and He would go to camp every, every summer and he'd buy a bottle of whiskey. When he was there, it was like dirt cheap. They used to give the stuff away. But he would, he would buy a fifth of whiskey and he'd come back with about this much whiskey in the bottom of the bottle. Well, every summer he would take that, he wouldn't drink through the year, and then he would go back to camp and he'd buy another fifth of whiskey plus whatever he had in the bottom, and then he'd come back with whatever he had left, uh, which normally was a lot. And, and you would think, oh, my dad's drinking a whole fifth of whiskey just for going to camp, and actually that wasn't it. He was. He was rooming with all these guys, and they were all sharing drinks and whatnot. Anyway, so he died with like all these little bottles of <laughs> half bottles of whiskey, because <laughs> yeah. none of none of the rest of his kids drink. I don't know whatever happened. Whiskey, somebody must have taken. Somebody must have taken. Anyway, okay. So delivering criminals. So they're not actually aiming for you. So when they argue, well, yeah, the you know the ice cubes just happen to have monsters in the in the in the ice cubes. When they're arguing that, they're talking to us. They're talking to us, and it doesn't mean anything to us, but it really means a lot to somebody suffering from delirium tremens. Alcohol abuse is a maladaptive drinking pattern in which drinking interferes with your role obligations. That would be your obligation as uh, your responsibilities. Uh, at work, your responsibilities at home, uh, all, all of your responsibilities, all your social responsibilities. Estimated heritability of alcohol dependency or abuse is 0.357 for males and 0.262 for females. Among males, alcoholism is a, in a first degree relative is a single best predictor of alcoholism. So if you see it in in a relative, a first degree relative. What, what would a first degree relative be? Who would that be? Who, who are my first degree relatives? Parents. Your parents are your first degree relatives. Anybody else? Siblings. Siblings? Somebody lives in your house with you. Yeah, it's a first degree relative. So if you have a brother or sister that's an alcoholic, if you have a mother or father that's an alcoholic, uh, the probability, you see it as a positive thing. You see out drinking as a positive thing. So you're more likely to be an alcoholic as well. Adopted children are more susceptible to dependency if one or both of their biological parents was alcohol dependent. Identical twins have twice the concordance rate as fraternal twins do, of course. Identical twins have the same DNA, fraternal twins don't. Sometimes they're not even the same gender. Researchers have uh, found a gene that alters the dopamine receptor DRD2 DRD4 gene moderates alcohol cravings. So those of us with DRD4, uh, the DRD4 gene, uh, we don't crave alcohol at all. But the DRD2, uh, we see this is uh, this is the. <laughs> I was looking this up on the internet. They call it the dirty gene. Uh, this is the gene that makes you do crazy things, uh, do wild and crazy things. Uh, makes you drink. It makes you smoke pot. Uh, makes you smoke cigarettes, uh, it makes you have strange sex with odd people. Uh, that's the DRD2 gene. Uh, DRD2 is found also in people with attention deficit disorder, as interesting as that is. These people are also more susceptible to alcoholism, of course, and of course uh, they're susceptible to just about any drug, as you can see. The meth user, the cocaine user, uh, when they are uh, When uh, the alcohol is, is close to them, uh, these individuals, the control individuals, are thinking a lot more deeply, as you can see. Their, their brains are lit up a lot more. These individuals just do it. I guess that's where they got the whole Nike commercial. Just do it. Alcohol's anxiety-relieving effects may be enhanced among uh, children of alcohol abusers. They, may, uh, they seem to uh, lack the feedback mechanism that signals overconsumption. So they don't know when it's time to stop. How long does it take you to get drunk? 
Uh, yeah, let's give, uh, let's give everybody in the room a shot. Everybody gets a shot. No, two shots. Everybody gets two shots of tequila. How long is it going to take us to feel that tequila? Right away? 20 minutes. Instantaneous? 20 minutes? 30 minutes maybe? <laughs> You'll be the drunk at 60 to 90 minutes after you take your last one. I, I can give you, I can, we can pass the bottle around here. <laughs> <laughs> and then you guys can leave the classroom and, and you won't be drunk until you get in the uh, elevator. This is perfect. Okay, that's very, very you logical. Your next class. <laughs> <laughs> that's what most of you guys are in my next class. So this isn't going to work. People with select personalities are prone to overconsumption. Individuals with a quick, quick temper. Wait a minute, this sounds like DRD2. <coughs> Uh, gene, doesn't it? The, the dopamine receptor site. Quick temper, impulsive, intolerant of frustration, vulnerable to depression, attraction to a site excitement. That sounds like DRD2 gene, as odd as that may seem. Current models of alcohol dependency uh, emphasize the interactions of environmental and genetic factors. Children who are problem breakers tend to be high in sensation seeking, impulsiveness, disinhibition, <coughs> deviant peer group association, and low parental control. Why would there be low parental control over these kids? If ADD and alcoholism have something to do with one another, and we've got an ADD kid, how much are you going to control that kid? Throw him outside. Just let him run. Isn't that what most parents do with ADD kids? Johnny's laughing because that's what happened to him. Yeah. <laughs> That's what happened to me. <laughs> uh, you think I'm kidding. My mom used to throw me outside and she'd say, go back in the woods and I don't want to see you until, until dark. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, when they assessed the parents of problem children, they found that the parents were less supportive of their children. They had less uh, than ideal marriages, so they were thinking about other things. Rather than raising their children, they were thinking of... Uh, of what was going on in their lives as far as their, as far as their marriages were concerned. They were more involved in their marriages than they were in their children. People who drink tend to have uh, a temperament that includes attraction to excitement and intolerance of frustration. This all sounds like ADD and ADHD. This sounds like the DRD2 uh, dopamine receptor site gene. Uh, people who drink uh, tend to have behavioral under control, which is per, uh, a personality syndrome characterized by aggressiveness, unconventionality, and impulsiveness. And of course, if that ADHD, ADHD, I don't know what is. People who drink tend to have negative emotionality, which is a state of alcohol abuse characterized by depression and anxiety. And as we said before, uh, the number of people who are alcoholics who uh, suffer from anxiety and suffer from depression is extremely high. Wow. <clears throat> the tension reduction hypothesis states that drinking is reinforcing because it reduces stress and tension. Well, there you go. I mean, that's all. That's the only reason we're doing it. Isn't it? So I'm depressed, so I think I'll go out and get drunk. Well, we all know that that doesn't work for me because when I drink, I get depressed. But if I were to... See, that's what they told me to do when I was in the military. My wife leaves me runs off with my best friend, so my friends come over and they take me out and get me drunk. They say, this is this will help, this will make you feel better, make me feel worse. Because there's something wrong, obviously, I'm upside down and backwards, everybody knows that. I can't, I can't drink, I, if I drink coffee, don't do anything. If I take opiates, shoot up with heroin when I get, you know, I'm waiting, nothing's happening, come on, where's the pain control? You know, nothing's happening with me. <clears throat> They tried to knock me, I told you, but they tried to knock me out for surgery and they started cutting on me and I was still awake. I was supposed to be, <laughs> I was supposed to be anesthetized. I wasn't. Yeah, I know, there's something wrong. Okay, the self-awareness model states that alcohol distorts uh, information processing, making the drinkers thinking uh, less self-critical. Uh, Self-handicapping model states that drinking is an excuse for personal failure. Uh, so we have a lot of different reasons why people drink, obviously. And, of course, pick your poison, I guess. Uh, social contacts exert a strong influence on drinking. Uh, members of fraternities and sororities drink more than other individuals, and we've seen uh, the statistics 
Uh, they drink uh, a lot more than other college students. Men who drink heavily may seek out social contacts in which this is tolerated, in other words, uh, same-sex groups. And that may be one of the reasons why people go to bars. They go to bars because everybody else is drinking there. Uh, so, of course, this will be socially acceptable for them to get as snockered as they possibly want to be. And, of course, now they're competing against all these other guys in the room. All these other guys have exactly the same problem that they do. Anxiety, depression, complaining about their wives or girlfriends or whatever. Alcohol expectancies, uh, beliefs that alcohol predict uh, its uh, effects on the individual. Uh, so if you think that it's going to make you happy, it should make you happy. If you think it's going to make you sad, it might, may make you sad. Uh, it all depends on, uh, on how, what you're, you're thinking when uh, you get drunk. Beliefs about peer use uh, predict the individual's use. Uh, so if you have peers that uh, when they get drunk, it like, well, that's what happened to me. All my peers took me out to get me drunk. And of course, I did get drunk, and I threw up, and I got sad. And of course, they're drunk, and they're, they don't notice what's happening. You know, the more they drink, the happier they get. I don't know. I'm backwards, obviously. <laughs> Drug treatment, uh, one detoxification agent is naltrexone. So not, not only can you shoot somebody up uh, who is dying of a, of a heroin overdose with naltrexone, but you can also use it for alcohol. It will take the edge off the alcohol. It's, a, oh, it's not only an opiate an antagonist, uh, but it also uh, takes away the, uh, the effects of the alcohol. So if you take naltrexone and then get drunk, all you, the only effects you'll have is, is a hangover. Uh, you'll feel sick, but it won't make you happy anymore, or however, whatever your reaction is. So I guess I could take naltrexone and go out and get drunk, and I wouldn't get unhappy. I wouldn't get depressed. That might work. I know. <laughs> Once upon a time when I was in the United States military, uh, I worked in the laboratory. And uh, we had an individual that was a pretty heavy alcoholic. He was a first sergeant of another squadron. Uh, and his wife got upset, and she had a really good, uh, she had a good relationship with the doctor. So she got, talked the doctor into giving her antabuse. Antabuse is a, is a drug that makes you throw up if you drink. So she did that. She started spicing her husband's something. I don't know. He, he was drinking something, probably his Bloody Marys or something. Anyway, she started spiking him with enemies, and this guy started with uh, Not just whatever he was drinking then, but he would go to the uh, go to the NCO club after work, and he'd start drinking, and he would just start puking. And he went in to see the doctor. And <laughs> it was a different doctor, so the doctor had to clue what was going on. She was slipping him a Mickey uh, to try to get him from drinking. And of course, then they. This was in Germany. They sent him. They sent him to. Uh, uh, where were we? We were at Ramstein, and they sent him to Landstuhl, which is an army hospital. And of course, the army hate the Air Force. <laughs> so they, nothing, nothing got done. <laughs> and so um, one day she was down in the emergency room getting some more. It was the ER doctor that was giving her the. the uh, and abuse. Anyway, she was down there getting the and abuse, and her husband came to pick her up. And he came, he walked in, and she was getting this and abuse, and he just hit the ceiling, as you can imagine. Anyway, they tried to sue. You can't sue military medical people, but he tried to sue the doctor, and he tried to he he uh, tried to sue his wife, which you can't do either. Uh, anyway, eventually they got a divorce, and he died of cirrhosis of the liver, which is kind of exciting if you think about it. He was also kicked out of the service and stayed in Germany. Um, stayed in Germany and uh, bought a gas house and uh, eventually drank himself to death, which is always exciting. Anyway, uh, not a happy story, but that's aversion therapy uh, and abuse. It makes you vomit if you try to, to drink alcohol. Relapse prevention programs, self-help groups, uh, are like AA, they control your drinking. Uh, they train you how to refuse uh, drink, uh, the, uh, drinking, and they show you how to cope. Uh, how, they give you social skills to help you cope. That's AA. If you watch the television show, I think it's on tonight. Mom? 
it, yeah, it's about a it's about a, a daughter, a mother and a daughter, and, and they're both heavy addicts, or they were. Now they're going to AA. It's about it's about uh, uh, their interaction with each other and the fact that the mother's a, a dry drunk practically every second. She's really a mean lady. Most prevention programs derive one of, of two perspectives. Wellness uh, theory proposes that health beha healthy behavior is a conscious and deliberate approach among people who have a sense that their worlds are coherent and understandable, and problem behavior therapy suggests that risky behaviors often occur together as a syndrome. So that's most prevention programs. One of the things that prevention programs do, well, this is, we're talking about prevention programs. Uh, one of the things that AA does, it tells you that it's not your fault. Uh, tells you that it's a disease, it's the disease, the famous disease model, uh, and of course that, that works. A lot of people, they feel guilty about some of the things that they've done, some of the people that they've hurt, and of course part of the, uh, the whole process uh, of getting better is uh, apologizing to the people that you've hurt. Uh, my second wife was an alcoholic. I didn't realize it uh, when we got married. Uh, as a matter of fact, we had a drinking contest before we got married, and I won. I, I don't know how I did that. <laughs> I know. So I'm thinking she tanked. What I mean is she was she was really not that as drunk as she was acting. She kept flashing me, which is one of the reasons. <laughs> uh, so maybe I. Maybe I lost. I don't know. It's, it's really hard to say. Anyway, uh, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, she was an alcoholic. Uh, so, uh, and I already had kids. Uh, we were only together for about five months. We were only married for about five months. We were together for about a year and a half. Uh, but uh, afterwards, she ran, she ran off with another guy, my best friend again. Uh, she ran off with another guy, and... Uh, she got another assignment to another base. She was out at Beagle in uh, California. <clears throat> and uh, so one day she calls me up on the telephone. She says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I hurt you and the kids. Uh, I didn't want to, uh, but uh, I was an alcoholic the entire time. She didn't drink the entire time that we were married. And of course, you can imagine how, what kind of a, uh, a, a pressure that put on her. You know, So here she is, she's okay for, you know, for extended length of time, then all of a sudden she couldn't handle it anymore. And she went out and started drinking again, as sad as that is. Well, that's kind of a sad story, but she called me up and she apologized. Is that the one that's bad? No, 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 that was my first one. Uh, no, this one, uh, actually, uh, during that conversation, she said, I'd like to have your baby, which is really kind of an interesting thing to say to somebody when you're apologizing for them. <laughs> I know at the time she was in Georgia, and I'm, I'm thinking, well, how in the world am I going to get a semen specimen to Georgia without it? Anyway. <laughs> it? It never happened. She she married somebody else. I think she's been married. See, my first wife's been married six times. I think she's been married five times. I know. She was married twice before she married me. Yeah. Yeah. And I married her at 21. She'd already been married twice. Yeah. yeah. She's swamp, swamp girl from the Okefenokee swamp in Georgia. Really interesting lady. <clears throat> Wait a minute. I can count. I can, I can do the count. Three, four, five. Yeah, she's been married five times, I think. That's the last I heard. She's been married five times. Her biggest problem was she couldn't get pregnant. Uh, and she thought it was the guy's fault, of course. Turned out to be her fault. Uh, anyway, okay. <clears throat> Smoking, uh, okay, so let's not talk about alcohol anymore. Let's talk about tobacco. Uh, smoking peaked in the United States in the early 1960s. Uh, that's when I was growing up. And I've told you the stories about going to people's houses and everybody had ashtrays and all the ashtrays were full. I had a neighbor that had a candlestick ashtray and uh, they'd filled it up, you know, it had that really base in it. And he would put out his cigarette and he would stuff the cigarette butt down, down into the base. You know, it's a candlestick, it's about this tall. And that thing was just packed. I mean, it was full. Sometimes it was a catch on fire. 
and smoke would start coming out. You know, it's, and it's, he smoked uh, camel, filterless camels. So he would just sit there and kind of breathe all that, uh, all that smoke was rolling out of his, his uh, ashtray. He thought it was a pretty good deal. Uh, that way he didn't have to clean it out. <clears throat> anyway, everybody had ashtrays back then. Uh, about half of the men, adult men in the United States smoked and about uh, one third of the women. If you watch a television show from the 1960s, I can assure you, uh, or a movie from the 1960s, everybody's going to be smoke, will be smoking. It was considered attractive to smoke at that time. Uh, the tobacco companies were lying to us. Uh, they knew that uh, tobacco was, uh, was ruining people's health and they, did, and they uh, fought against anybody that would say that. So for that reason, uh, that's one of the reasons you, you see these advertisements on television today uh, about uh, low-tar uh, low nicotine cigarettes are still destructive. They're just as destructive as regular, regular cigarettes and whatnot. Uh, so that was the 1960s, and this is the era that I grew up in. Uh, just about everybody I knew smoked, uh, all the adults except for my parents. Uh, so my parents were considered odd. They, were, they didn't drink and they didn't smoke, uh, so they were considered strange. And that's one of the reasons why they were, weren't very sociable, and maybe that's the reason I'm not very sociable, because my parents tried to stay away from these people. Uh, all my uncles and aunts smoked. Uh, and they didn't drink, but they smoked. Uh, a lot of smoking going on in the United States. Today, about 19.8% of the U.S. adult population smokes. Uh, most of the decrease occurred among the upper uh, socioeconomic status uh, individuals and men. Uh, lower socioeconomic status men continue to smoke, and they still do. So if you go to, um, if you go to a, uh, a homeless shelter, you'll see most of them in smoking, even today. Uh, smoking among women uh, has increased sharply, and that's ma mostly because they started uh, Advertise. They, they made, started making cigarettes for women, and they made it look very attractive for women to hold these skinny little cigarettes and smoke their cigarettes. Smoking rebounded among U.S. teens in the late 1990s. Smoking is increasingly prevalent in Asian countries and developing parts of the world. So if you go to China, China, geez, they smoke like chimneys. Uh, Japan's about the same way. The Jap Japanese smoke a lot as well. However, the Asians in the United States don't smoke hardly at all as odd as that seems. Uh, smoking is the most prevalent among American Indians and Alaska Natives, about 36.4%. Uh, in Oklahoma, uh, they, uh, all the tribes have smoke shops where you can buy uh, cigarettes for a half price, as odd as that may seem. The second most prevalent group of smokers, of course, is white people. We are number two, <clears throat> 18, between 18 and 24 year olds, about 21.4% smoke. Uh, African American adults smoke at 19.8%, and Asian Americans, of course, at 9.6%. So Asian Americans don't smoke hardly at all, <clears throat> as compared to everybody else. Uh, many teenagers be, uh, begin to experiment with smoking during middle school and high school. By age 12, about 13% of boys and 11% of girls are frequent smokers. That's by grade 12, I'm sorry, not age 12. Defined as, as having smoked uh, cigarettes on 20 or more of the past 30 days. And as you can see, this is the way it looks. Uh, so by, the, uh, by grade 12, you've got a lot of people that are smoking. A lot of the individuals, all the cool kids are smoking. Cigarette smoking is the single most preventable cause of illness, dis disability, and premature death in much of the world. The mortality rate, rate for smokers is 70% higher than for non-smokers. 70% higher for, more, for smokers as, far as, not, as compared to non-smokers. Half of all deaths due to cardiovascular disease, lung cancer, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are smoking related. An adult who has smoked two packs per day for 20 years can expect to lose eight years off their life. Uh, and as I told you before, I have a, a, a good friend uh, from West Virginia who started smoking when he was 12 or, a, or 13. Uh, he actually played uh, semi-pro baseball uh, just after graduating from high school. Then he joined the Air Force. He was in the Air Force for 20 years, smoked a lot of cigarettes. Uh, I thought he had stopped because we had discussed it, 
uh, but he died um, a couple months ago. Uh, I've got his picture on my other computer, not on this computer. Anyway, he, uh, he just died. Uh, and of course, I was older than him, and uh, we always argued about whether he was, it was going to kill him or not. And he always said no, and I always said yes. And of course, I was right. <laughs> uh, I was right, <clears throat> which is unfortunate. BPDE is a, a chemical in cigarette smoke. It's a positive agent of lung cancer. BPDE damages a cancer suppressor gene causing lung tissue, tissue to mutate, which is always exciting. Women are more susceptible to carcinogens in tobacco than men. Why would women be more susceptible than men? What is it about men, what is it about women that makes you more susceptible to lung cancer? Why are you more susceptible to the carcinogens? And when we're talking about the carcinogens, we're not just talking about lung cancer. We're also talking about uh, cervical cancer. We're talking about breast cancer. Uh, these cancers can uh, move. They metastasize. Uh, and they can develop in, in, in interesting places. They don't seem like they have anything to do with the tobacco. What, what is it about women? What's the difference between boys and girls? This could be the hair. It can't be the hair. It must be something else. What else is there? You guys are protected by estrogen most of your young lives while you're ovulating. As long as you're ovulating, you've got all that estrogen to protect you, but you still are more susceptible to lung cancer if you smoke. Why would that be? Men have bigger lungs, you know, and that's it. That's the reason. Men have bigger lungs. You, your lungs are too small, or smaller, not too small. It's just the right size, but your lungs are small. Nicotine uh, causes serum cholesterol to rise, so that uh, it can give you cardiovascular disease. It increases the risk of miscarriage, sudden infant death, and low birth weight infants and pregnant women. Uh, the average weight of a woman who doesn't smoke is about, of, a, of an infant is about seven and a half pounds. For women who smoke, it's between five and six pounds. And that's because tobacco is a vasoconstrictor. And whenever you're smoking and you're constricting your blood vessels, that means the baby's not getting enough blood. And that's where it gets its nutrients. So if you smoke way too much, then you're going to have a baby that's low birth weight. And because of that, of course, there are going to be parts of its brain that are not mature. And one of those areas of the brain is the area of the brain that tells the baby if they're breathing carbon monoxide. And this is one of the reasons why babies die from sudden infant death syndrome. Uh, when they are on their faces, if they're sleeping on their faces. Uh, normally, if you sleep on your face and you're not getting enough oxygen, your brain tells you to roll your head over and you will do it automatically. You don't have to be awake. It doesn't wake you up. Uh, same thing with the baby, as long as its brain is completely mature. But, an, uh, but a premature baby or a low birth weight baby, a lot of times they, this portion of their brain is not mature enough. And so they're laying on their face and they're breathing into their whatever, the plastic sheet or whatever. Uh, and if they're breathing too much carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide, uh, their brain does not uh, tell them that it's time to roll, they need to roll over. And that's what causes sudden infant death syndrome. Hmm. I know, it's kind of a tragedy. So how long does it take this area of the brain to develop? Well, as long as it's a full-term baby, then you're probably okay. As long as mom didn't do something stupid like smoke cigarettes or smoke marijuana. Marijuana will do exactly the same thing. It will make all this stuff immature. It will make their brains immature. Now we got a really serious problem. This baby is more likely to die of sudden infant death syndrome. Uh, smoking affects disguised as aging. Uh, the woman on the left is actually doesn't smoke. The woman on the right does. As you can see, her hair is all dried out. You don't see the difference between the two white chicks. Did I say chick? I'm not supposed to say chick. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it has a lot to do with collagen. Collagen is the uh, is the substance in your skin that allows you 
elasticity. Uh, if you don't have, if your college, as your collagen ages, uh, becomes less elastic, therefore you get wrinkles and they won't go away. You know. I got wrinkles, I know I do, but I'm an old, old man. Environmental tobacco smoke, uh, that secondhand smoke and thirdhand smoke, contains an even higher concentration of many of the carcinogens. Uh, Non-smokers who are regularly exposed to uh, secondhand and thirdhand smoke are, are, are at increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And this is one of the reasons why going into a casino uh, where smoking is allowed or going into a bar where smoking is allowed, you're actually uh, getting a lot more carcinogens than you would if, uh, they, if it wasn't allowed, certainly. Or even if you were smoking yourself. So why do people smoke? <clears throat> When you, the first time you, you smoke a cigarette is fairly unpleasant, it kind of makes well, just about everybody sick. There's a lot of toxins in there. It makes you cough, it makes you, you can barely stand it. It turns you green. You get sick to your stomach because, they're, because of the toxins. Uh, social contacts, role modeling, and peer influence lead many teenagers to start smoking. This is one of the reasons why they took it off of television. No more cigarette commercials on television. Uh, you very rarely see anybody smoking on television. If you do see somebody smoking on television, you know it's a bad guy. That identifies them as a bad person. In the old days, uh, the I Love Lucy show, which none of you have ever seen originally, <laughs> but that's okay, they used to come out and smoking uh, Chesterfield cigarettes. Lu Lucy and Ricky would come out smoking Chesterfield cigarettes and telling everybody how wonderful that tasting they were. How mild and pleasant they were. I know, that's in the old days. So they were role models. We don't do that kind of stuff anymore. I remember when I was a kid, I used to take a piece of paper and I'd roll it up like a cigarette and I'd walk around smoking my cigarette. It didn't have anything in it. I mean, you know, I know. <laughs> because it's so cool. And I would want to go down to the candy store and buy those, plat those candy cigarettes. That was cool oh, until they, that yeah, they had red they on the end. Like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that anyone smoked Lucy. Oh, yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> My brother is an iron people. <laughs> well, so there's, you can smoke other things. You don't have to smoke tobacco. So that's what we're talking about right now. We're, we're talking about um, the uh, tree bark off of uh, the. Uh, oh, okay. This is what it taste? It's tasty. You can smoke corn silk. Of course you do. Well, you know. Anyway, so role models. And the reason I smoke cigarettes is because my favorite uh, crime fighter was Boston Blackie. And he always had a cigarette either hanging out of his mouth or in his fingers. And it was old Boston Blackie. If you don't ever see Boston <laughs> television shows, it's not as well. Advertising plays a major role, of course, in why people smoke. Uh, there used to be a uh, NASCAR. Uh, used to be extremely popular, and it was the Winston Cup. And of course, Winston was the cigarettes, and they used to give cigarettes away at the at the uh, at NASCAR races. They don't do that anymore. It's not called the Winston Cup anymore. It's the Nextel Cup, if I remember correctly. But it's certainly not the Winston Cup. So that advertising is gone. Uh, they used to give away coats. They used to give away t-shirts. They used to give away all kinds of stuff to get people to start smoking. They don't do that anymore. It's against the law. And of course, they have had to pay $268 billion in fines. I know. And that's one of the reasons why we see these spots on television. And we will continue to see these spots for 25 years. Well, not 25 years from now, but 25 years from the lawsuit. The lawsuit was, was settled in 1998, I think. 287 million, that, it's the three major companies. Uh, R.J. Reynolds, uh, Lorelar, uh, I can't remember the other, Al 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 Altia, Alicia, I don't know, anyway. Um, they keep selling their companies, so. Uh, but they have to pay that, uh, that, that fine. Uh, does it, did it cut into their profits? Yeah, it cut into their profits, but they're still making a profit. Even with 
having to pay $287 billion. We're not talking about million dollars. We're talking about billion dollars. And this will be going on for another 17 years? Is that right? No. Another seven years. Vulnerability uh, factors in teens of, uh, who start smoking, low uh, feelings of competence and control, perception of lack of social support, rebelliousness, it makes you feel rebellious. Uh, if you think of all the guys that smoked cigarettes, they were the cool guys. They were the, the, uh, the uh, I don't know, what, who were they? Who were these guys? But they were the cool ones, right? All right. <clears throat> uh, strong need for independence, of course, and stress management. Uh, you get stressed out, you start smoking a cigarette, raises your dopamine level, and your stress level goes down. Uh, biological factors come into play as heavy smokers develop dependence on nicotine, reinforcing properties of smoking. Uh, nicotine stimulates the sympathetic nervous system, causing the release of catecholamines and serotonin, stimulating uh, dopamine release in the brain. The, the brain's reward system and inducing relaxation. Therefore, tobacco can uh, tell you to relax. And it works, it actually does work. As you can see, this young three-year-old is certainly relaxed. There's no smoke coming out of that cigarette that I guess you noticed. That. Schachter and his colleagues first introduced the nicotine titration model in 1977. Uh, the theory uh, that smokers who are physically dependent on nicotine regulate their smoking to maintain a steady level of the drug in their bodies. Schachter discovered that most smokers smoke approximately the same number of cigarettes a day, hence attempting to maintain a select titration in their systems. Uh, Schachter experimented with nicotine levels and discovered that when given lower nicotine cigarettes, the smokers increased their consumption, and when given higher nicotine cigarettes, they lowered their consumption. We know this for a fact, so we know that you're getting the same amount of nicotine. If you've got a low nicotine cigarette, you just smoke more, more cigarettes. That's the way it works. If it's a higher nicotine cigarette, uh, then you smoke fewer of them. If you've ever noticed people smoking, and of course, I don't know if you watch people when they, when they smoke, a lot of times they'll hold it in their fingers and they'll only take a couple puffs. And this has to do with the titration system. In other words, they're taking in a select amount of nicotine. They need to take in a select amount of nicotine. If you notice, when people start, uh, light up a cigarette, they'll take a couple of really deep drags off of that cigarette. And then they'll hold it for a couple of minutes. Well, they'll hold it for, I don't know, 20 seconds or 15 seconds. And then they'll take another drag. But they won't take two drags or three drags. They just take one drag. They're trying to build up. The, the first two drags were to, to replace the nicotine in their system, and, and after that, they only take one drag. Watch people sometimes smoking cigarettes. In the old days, they used to keep it in their mouths. They used to hold it in their mouths. And they would suck on it every once in a while. But they, they, they didn't suck it all the way down to the filter. I mean, you know, you could do that. You just take all that back into your lungs. But it's fairly toxic. Anyway, I know this has to do with Schachter and his his, uh, <laughs> his experiments. Twin and adoption studies have shown that heritability of tobacco uh, smoking tobacco is about sixty percent. Uh, Lerman et al. in 1999 found that people with DRD2, there you go, there, we've got that same gene, uh, it's, but it's not just the DRD2 gene, it's also the nine repeat allele that we're dealing with here. They're less efficient at removing excess dopamine from their synapses, and so they don't have the need for dopamine stimulation. In other words, if these individuals, every time you, you take a drag off that cigarette, you get a dopamine spike. But if you've got this nine repeat allele, the DRD2 nine repeat allele, you really don't have to, all you need to do is just take one drag off the cigarette and you're fine because the dopamine will stay in the synapses uh, because of this uh, mutation, this strange mutation. It's odd to think that we have mutated because of smoking cigarettes, but the reality is, and I was listening to a book uh, while I was driving back from uh, Iowa uh, about um, about uh, where man is headed, uh, how things are going, what's going to happen next. And one of the interesting things was that uh, they were talking about uh, how we adapt to our environment, whatever that environment may happen to be. 
Uh, so if we are in a technological environment, here we have, we have how many computers do we have about? Five computers out of seven people? That's kind of interesting, isn't it? So we have five people that uh, are, have, have their, uh, uh, that are using computers. Everybody's got their phone out just in case it might ring. One, two, three, except for Sheldon. Kind of boring. No. <laughs> You're real boring, bitch. Yeah. Where's your cell phone? Johnny got your cell phone. I was just worried. So, yeah. so what happens is if somebody pings you or, or whatever, or somebody tries to communicate with you, and there are important people that need to communicate and not the show. <laughs> I've got my phone. It's time to have it. There's only like three people on that one. Oh, geez, I've got five messages. I don't know how to do it. Let's see if somebody's calling me. I guess not. Evidently not. Anyway, the, the idea was that we are adapting to our environment, and our environment is very technologically uh, heavy right now. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why you have your computers out, and what you're doing on your computers. I'll assume you're not looking at pornography. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's... <laughs> I was reading an article the other day, and they were talking about uh, sexual response, and they were saying that uh, sexual response is a lot lower now than it ever has been. People are having less sex than they've ever had, than like the history of mankind. And you ask yourself, what the hell's going on? And the answer is that uh, it may have something to do with pornography. It may have a lot to do with pornography. Uh, it also may have the, uh, have to do with the fact that people are tired when they get uh, when they go to bed at night, so they're too tired to have sex, I guess. Um, as odd as it may seem. I was very surprised that when I went home that my wife was Facebooking like all day long. She Facebooked all day long. Yeah, I know. She, and she was too tired to watch television tonight. That's how much she was Facebooking. She obviously wasn't Facebooking with me because I'm not on Facebook. I know. Uh-oh. You think she's got a boyfriend? <laughs> And the other question is, is he in this room right now? Is that, okay. It's obviously not Sheldon, so I, you're okay, John. <laughs> so the reality is that we adapt to our environment. And so these individuals adapted, they mutated uh, to adapt to cigarettes, as odd as that may seem. And now, of course, we have a lot fewer smokers than we've ever had. It's really kind of fascinating to, to uh, anticipate where we're going to be heading in the future. Because, and I keep telling you this, we're, you guys need to figure out who people are going to be in the future. Uh, what kind of mental illnesses we're going to have. Every time we come up with a new DSM, uh, they take out some things, they put in other things. Uh, so what is it going to be in the future? Uh, they, they put uh, um, gaming addiction. In, in this DSM-5. That's really yeah. So, you know, 15 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, people, well, there were some gaming addiction, but they're not nearly to what it is today. Who, who controls the DSM? Is it the APA? Uh, it's the American Psy uh, Psychiatric Association. <coughs> yeah, so it's not that APA, it's the other APA. Okay. So it's the psych psychiatrist, not the psychologist. <sighs> So I don't know. I don't know where we're going. I don't know where we're headed. Um, I, of course, I'm really old. Um, I'm, you know, I listened to a book on the way down here instead. Of, I don't know what, what what do people do when they're in a car all by themselves? Do you listen? Do you listen to a book? Mm -hmm. Music. Do you listen really to music. Okay. <laughs> yes. Maybe yes. rock rock out. I I, I do that sometimes. There we go. Barry Manilow. Oh my Barry Manilow. <laughs> If I tell you you might copy me. <laughs> Sorry? I said if I tell you you might copy me. Uh, oh, well, I want to be just like you. Oh, no. Okay. No, that okay. I can't do that. Uh, I tried to get Sarah to oh, like it's it's very mental. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no music, no clips. Just drive. Just drive? 
So you concentrate on the road? No. <laughs> wow, that sounds really exciting, Shelly. <laughs> I told you he's the most boring person in the room. Of course, I'm right behind him, like that far behind him. The effect management model proposes that smokers strive to regulate their emotional states. Positive effects smokers are trying to increase stimulation, feel relaxed, or trying to create some other positive emotional state when they smoke. The negative effects smokers are trying to reduce anxiety, trying to reduce guilt, or fear, or any other negative emotion like depression. Uh, so it really all just depends as to why people are smoking. Information campaigns, successful campaigns provide non-smoking peer role models. They shift the social prototype associated with smoking, or at least they try to. Uh, we tried this with crystal meth. We tried this with uh, alcohol. Um, uh, just say no, you know, the, those whole programs. And of course, smoking was part of that program. Traditional campaigns have been less effective among ethnic groups who are targeted by tobacco art advertising. A number of years ago, there was an, uh, an ad uh, program that was, uh, it was Miller. Miller did MGB, MGB, Miller. Is that, is that a beer? Oh, MGB. MGD? It's a D? What is it? Genuine Draft. Genuine Draft. That's what it was. MGD. If you remember, yeah, MGD. They, were, they, they targeted a select group of individuals in the United States with the, the MGD campaign. And it wasn't white people. It was Hispanics. Yeah. So if, if you saw an MGD commercial on uh, advertisement on <coughs> television, it had salsa music. Uh, there were a lot of people flipping their hips around. Uh, cool guys were just kind of standing there with their partial beards, drinking their MGD, and of course the women were dancing all around them, flipping their hips around. You know, all that stuff. Yeah. So it was really kind of interesting that they were targeting a select group of individuals. Uh, but tobacco advertising does exactly the same thing. Uh, who are they going to? Who are they going to? They sh who should they target? Wait a minute. Who who smokes the most? Yeah, but there aren't enough of you guys. So if we want, if, if we're really trying to sell cigarettes, who should we target? I guess white people. But they're the, they're the most likely not to smoke, as odd as that may seem. <clears throat> so Hispanics are, are a pretty good target. African Americans, uh, there are more Hispanics in the United States now than African Americans. African Americans uh, have traditionally not smoked nearly as much as everybody else has. So they don't really target African Americans like they do other ethnic groups. I can remember where I was. There we go. Okay. I feel like you're... They do. Yeah. And uh, they smoke a lot more non filtered cigarettes. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, they can smoke anywhere. Yeah. They can take their dogs into the restaurants. <laughs> Increasing aversive uh, consequences, increase the uh, in, uh, aversive consequences of smoking. Uh, and of course, we've done that. A, a pack of cigarettes costs almost $6. Uh, I can remember. Cigarettes costing a quarter, uh, a pack of cigarettes costing a quarter. Uh, if you, of course, the military used to give them away. We used to get them with our K rations, package of ten. They don't do that anymore. I don't think they do. We used to get beer for dinner every night. Oh, who gives away beer for dinner? Yeah, so people would drink their supper. <laughs> Not me, of course. I've always been a good boy. Okay, so we can increase the, the cigarette tax, and of course they've done that. Um, and it's almost like, uh, and they can increase the punishment for uh, underage smoking, which they haven't really done at this point. 
We can ban uh, smoking in public places, and that's happened all over the United States. Inoculation programs teach adolescents practical skills in resisting social pressures to smoke. The most successful programs are based on a social learning model, which focuses on three variables that influence initiation of smoking. Uh, the biggest one is social pressure. Of course, you're, if your peers smoke, then you're going to smoke. Uh, medical information about how destructive it is. And the last, of course, is anxiety. A uh, program developed by Richard Evans, and this is the guy right here, uh, in 2003 for adolescents. He used films, role-playing, and rehearsal. Uh, he has practice sessions uh, uh, where he helps uh, teens develop their social skills and refusal skills. Uh, smoking inoculation in the 7th and 8th grades cuts the probability of smoking in half. <clears throat> It is estimated that inoculation and secession programs have saved three million lives by keeping children from ever starting and getting adults to quit smoking. Every day, 4,000 new teens take their first puff. 2,000 of them will become uh, chronic smokers. Program, programs that uh, fall into two categories, programs fall into two categories, addiction model and the cognitive behavioral approaches, Addiction model treatments are moderately successful as a standalone program. Uh, things such as nicotine gum, transdermal patches, uh, impregnated with nicotine. Uh, they have nicotine inhalers. Uh, Chantix, which blocks dopamine. Chantix is really kind of interesting. Uh, I have a brother-in-law that tried to use Chantix to uh, get off of, of tobacco. He's been smoking since he was seven. I know. I'm surprised he's still alive. He's in his, he's approaching 60. Uh, it looks like death warmed over. Uh, he is gray. He's, he's, yeah, he's, he ain't a white person. He's a, he's a gray guy. I mean, he is so gray. Um, because his circulation is so poor. But he tried Chantix, and what happened was uh, he developed PTSD. He started having uh, uh, nightmares, and they were recurring nightmares. Uh, so he had to go off Chantix, which is one of the side effects. Uh, and, and of course, Chantix blocks your dopamine. And dopamine is the reward reinforcement pathway. So while he's smoking, he's not getting the same reinforcement on Chantix. Uh, but he also can't form happy thoughts either. And that was part of the problem. Uh, Zyban uh, increases the dopamine so that you don't need the, the tobacco to, uh, to make yourself happy. Uh, cognitive behavioral treatments, uh, satiation is a form of aversion therapy in which a smoker is forced to increase smoking until an unpleasant state of fullness is reached, and that's known as rapid smoking. Uh, they'll put you in, usually put you in a small room, and they'll give you all the cigarettes that you want, and they tell you you have to smoke a cigarette at least every 10 minutes. So you have to, you have to draw down that cigarette uh, for for 10 minutes, you have 10 minutes to smoke that cigarette before you, you have to light up another cigarette. And of course, by the time you're done, you're pretty sick. Interventions uh, need to be targeted uh, to specific groups and take into account cultural traditions, values, and of course, gender. Males are more susceptible to this addiction than females are. Uh, successful programs with adolescents are those that enhance intrinsic and extrinsic motivation to quit through education and the use of rewards. Uh, they, are, they should be tailored to developmental uh, needs rather than being based on adult programs. Uh, provide, they need to provide social support. Uh, they need to make teens aware of, of other resources for remaining nicotine free. And of course, the earlier you start, the more likely that you're going to be able to to convince these individuals to never start smoking. Quitting smoking is determined by three individual factors, according to Liechtenstein and Glasgow uh, in 1997. Motivation to quit, including persistence uh, despite withdrawal symptoms, level of physical dependence on nicotine, and barriers to our to or supports in remaining smoke-free. So that would be your family supporting you. And there you go. That's the end of chapter nine. This is the 10th week. You have a paper that's due next week. Uh, don't get too excited if, if you, what in the world happened? 
Don't get too excited. Uh, I, I would love to get all the papers in so I could finish reading them. But if you don't have it done by next week, just get it in whenever you can. That's not a firm, it is a firm date, but if you don't get it in, geez, geez, Sheldon turns his papers in what? The day before I the grades are due. Is that graduation day. <laughs> <laughs> it can't happen this year. I have to have your grades in uh, like a week before your, your graduation day. So that somebody will sign off on, on all your stuff. Okay. What have I done here? Okay, chapter 10 uh, deals with uh, cardiovascular disease, if I'm not mistaken. I looked at this earlier. It's chapter 9. Thank you. Okay, chapter 10. <laughs> Come on, there we go. <clears throat> cardiovascular disease and diabetes, one of our more, one of our favorite topics. Okay. Of course, I've had a heart attack. I told you about my heart attack. And I've never had diabetes. Why did it do that? Uh, okay, cardiovascular disease. Uh, how big is your heart? It's about the size of a clenched fist. Weighs about 11 ounces. Uh, there are blood vessels, there are major blood uh, uh, arteries that run up and down. The one in the middle is known as the widow maker. Because if that one gets blocked, you're dead. Uh, who's the guy I was just reading about? Silent Bob. You know Silent Bob from the movies? Mm -hmm. Does anybody not know Silent Bob? I can't remember the other guy's name. Silent Jay. Bob. Jay. Dave? Jay. 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 Jay, that's right. Jay. <laughs> Jay's the one that swears on it. Silent Bob never says anything. He doesn't sign it. He's actually the director of the movie. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Silent Bob had a heart attack uh, when he was about 33, 37, something like that. Uh, and he almost died. He said he had 93% occlusion in his uh, widow maker, in his, that major artery. Uh, I had the same thing. I, I had exactly the same heart attack that he did. Uh, I, but mine was 97%. Uh, my friend had 100% occlusion, which means there's no blood running. Yeah, that's why he's dead, because he had 100% occlusion. Uh, I had 97%, but the reason that it didn't do any damage to me is because I exercise, because I lift weights, because I do things to, to uh, help my heart, and that's what I did. What time is it? 2.47. Okay, I can get through this, this slide. Anyway. So you got the Widowmaker, and it runs right down the, the front of your, uh, your uh, heart. Uh, the heart consists of three layers of tissue, the epicardium, the endocardium, and the myocardium. Uh, myo means muscle, uh, endo means inside, and epi means uh, the outside. Epi, epicardium is the protective outer covering. The endocardium is a uh, maintenance layer that's, uh, that's on the inside, and then the myocardium of course, is your heart. Anytime you see myo, it means... So if you have a myocardial infarction, infarction means death. So myocardial infarction means death of, of heart tissue, of heart muscle. Uh, and that can be a problem. I did not have a myocardial infarction. I do, do not have any dead spots on my heart. My dad had a heart attack when he was, what, 57, 58? Uh, and the whole back of his heart died. <clears throat> now you'd think if you had a dead spot in your heart that it would like rot out and blow a hole in it or something. But he lived for another 40 years, 30 years, another 30 years with half of his heart, back heart, a portion of his heart dead. So as long as you keep feeding it blood, you're okay. Uh, it's non-functional, but uh, and he didn't have any trouble with it. Uh, he got on it, onto an exercise program, and if you know anything about my mother, she hurt my poor dad. <laughs> she, drove, she drove that old man, that poor guy. She's, she's kind of a mean lady. Anyway, she, uh, she uh, made him exercise, and he would, uh, he'd walk a mile in her house. He'd, he'd 
cut these figure eights all through the house. And I don't know, it was like 47 trips around was a mile or something. My poor dad. I kind of felt sorry for it. The myocardium uh, pumps five or more quarts of blood each minute through four chambers. Uh, so you've got about five quarts of blood. There's the Widowmaker right there in the front. This is the Widowmaker right here. The heart itself is supplied with blood from a branch of the aorta, which allows blood to pump throughout the heart to keep it uh, supplied with blood and uh, keep it healthy. If one of these feeder arteries is blocked and the muscle that it feeds will die and the individual will have a, a heart attack. And of course, that's what happened to me. That's what happened to my dad. That's what happened to my friend. Uh, we all had heart attacks and it was all this one right here. And my blockage was right there, right there. The worst place in the world to have a, have a blockage was right there. And I'll explain it to you later. It's, it, it, uh, because I exercised so much, it folded over, and that's what my, my heart attack was. It wasn't a block. It wasn't that kind of a blockage. It had pinched itself off. Yeah. So if you stay healthy and you exercise, then you should be okay. I'll see you guys next time. Well, some of you, I'll see you in just a minute. But uh, okay. <laughs>